Today's episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast with Judd Apatow, brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor, the easiest way to shop for the best tickets, thanks to their revolutionary grading system. All we have now is baseball. That's it. There's no other sports. Guess what? I have good news. My listeners get $10 off baseball tickets the first time they use SeatGeek. Just use promo code BSMLB. It's that easy. Download the SeatGeek app today or go right to SeatGeek. Dot com. We're also brought to you by our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home. It's simple. It allows you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. In addition to getting a real mortgage approval, in minutes, you can even adjust the rate and length of your loan in real time to make sure you're getting the right solution for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash Bill Simmons, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. We are also brought to you by Joe House's new food podcast, House of Carbs. Subscribe right now. Joe House, nobody knows more about food. He came on. We did. We broke down the Ringer's top 50 fast food item list a couple months ago, and Joe House was like a cross between Mel Kiper Jr. and uh, and Barack Obama. I mean, that's how good it was. It was incredible. Uh, House is going to talk about food. He's going to have food arguments. It's going to be fun. It's not going to be like one of those foofy food podcasts where he's talking about you know the right way to cook duck. Now he's going to be arguing about best burgers, best milkshakes. Uh, things that he ate that he loved, all that stuff. So just subscribe. I promise you, you'll like it. If you enjoy House on this pod, you're going to like the food pod. He loves food more than he loves life itself. Check it out. Subscribe right now. And also, we're brought to you by TheRinger.com, where we just are having a phenomenal month. Basketball, Game of Thrones stuff, TV, movies, everything, you name it. It's been good. Good month for content here on TheRinger.com. Go there. Read our stuff. Read our great writers. And without further ado, here's Pearl Jam. Here with Judd Apatow, taping this on a Friday afternoon. And it's running the week you're listening to it. So if anything happens to either of us, we're still going to run the pod. It Who could, knows? The country's crazy right now. Who knows? Who knows what could happen to either of us? I say to my wife all the time, the only good thing about Trump is that it, it makes sex better because every time might be the last one. <laughs> right. <laughs> you just don't know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It is weird. It's different. definitely different weird. It's weird waking up every day now. I'm now I check, bored I check of it. Apple News to make sure nothing crazy happened. It's part of my day now. I, I've just reached saturation on it. Good. Where I was in like terror and frustration, and and now I'm just annoyed. Like, why can't everything be like the old days? Remember when Obama used to sing every once in a while? And you were like, <laughs> oh. Wasn't that nice? Or remember his kids and how we were like, oh, his kids seem so cool. And then they got older and we're like, wow, they still seem cool. Yeah. I, I just reminisce about old o Obama days. They were like an ABC <laughs> sitcom. Exactly. They, that we had that was on the air for eight years and we all liked it. Well, think about this. You have the president. Not everyone liked it. So uh, most people liked it. I mean, o Obama, you know, he's in there for eight years. I don't think he had two days that were as weird as every day of Trump. Yeah. There's no controversies, really, when you get down to it. Like, he wore a tan jacket once. I'm I trying mean, to think. It smoking. Was, smoking was a kind of, Is he smoking? Is he not smoking? That it, was a controversy. It was just like a hardworking president trying to do a good job, trying to figure out how to help people. And this is just madness. I, I, I always laugh about all these meetings with Russia because I think... Were they, were they also doing all these meetings with Spain? Like, they never come back and go, we did the same thing with Peru. <laughs> I mean, I met with Peru eight times. Why? No, they didn't meet with anybody yeah. but one country. Mm. And uh, When do you think it starts trickling into uh, the arts, the movies and TV, basically? because It's hard to because it takes so long yeah. for it to uh, process. So you know, will there be a couple of... Will there be movies in the future that are based on all of our paranoia and I'm going to say yes. I, I guess. I guess. But I also think 
you know, the studios want, you know, superhero movies. So where will you see it? I mean, you might see it on like the president show and you see it on talk shows, but in terms of storytelling, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. It's, it's so much weirder than anything that you could write. It, it's just so insane. I mean, the fact that every old picture of Donald Trump and his wife has, uh, him feeding her grapes or something. It's yeah. just too weird. It's like, it's like when you used to see those pictures of Gaddafi's apartment and how he <laughs> lived. Or It's like our whole life is Putin shirtless on a horse. Like That's what our country feels like now Yeah, in, in some ways. That's one thing you'll never see, Trump shirtless Trump on a shirt, horse. Well, he's gaining weight rapidly. <laughs> he's, not, he's not going shirtless, and he will not be riding horses anytime soon. And uh, it's, I mean, I, I feel, here's what makes me saddest. I feel sad that... Regardless if you're a Republican or Democrat, uh, uh, millions of people are being taken advantage of, and they don't seem to understand it, that yeah. they've been hypnotized, and they've been hypnotized into believing something uh, which is simple, which is, if you get rich people even richer, they'll hook you up. No, no, we'll hook you up. No, no, lower our taxes, and somehow something cool will happen to you. I'm not sure what, but if you give me more... I, you might get something, and people believe that. They're totally comfortable with that, I, uh, at least a, a large portion of people. Do you see the other side, though? I see the other side that the, the, uh, the world cha is changing quickly. Technology is, is, is destroying a lot of jobs. You, know, you go to the airport, they don't even have waitresses now. They just have iPads. Yeah. I, I, and so I, I understand the frustration and why you would think, well, how's the government going to help me? But Why do I want to sign up for a third decade of the Clintons? Yeah, but or a fourth you know, decade, I guess. But part of it is, I don't, you know, Obama didn't invent the iPad instead of the waitress. Yeah, I mean, the world is changing, and it's hard for the what people do for a living to keep up with it, with all of these seismic changes. But you know, this the Trump idea, which is just no regulations, let the rich people go wild, and I think things are going to get better. I, it, I have eight employees. If I made a lot of money, but I could have one employee instead of eight, I would. Employers are always looking to have less employees. Yeah, That's how the world works. When you make them richer, they don't go, great, I get to have 20,000 more people to worry about. They're, they're obsessed with getting rid of employees. Yeah, That's just how the world works, and it's terrible. I understand why people are frustrated, but you know, to have a guy that just wants to loot the country... Uh, be your savior, I, I don't get it. Because uh, a lot of the those people are, are mad about so many things. You're I just feel like he's a proxy for that stuff, you know. But he's not even one of them. That's what's interesting. You know, that, that, is, that is definitely true. I don't think that Donald Trump is sitting at home obsessing about, uh, you know, that women shouldn't have the right to choose. I don't think he has any issue with gay people. I, I think he's just in it to win and looking for... What what do I say that that makes me win? Right, and that's that to me is even scarier. That was my hope for the presidency, though, is that he was behaving a certain way because it was going to be what it took to win. And once yeah. he got in, he. But if anything, he he was crazier than I expected. I saw yeah. the other side. I understood yeah. why people didn't want to vote for Hillary and mm -hmm. people staying in their party, all that stuff. But hey, regardless of what side you're on, we've never had a president who his first. And only concern the entire time is what's good for him. Oh, it's he so doesn't bizarre. care about anybody else. It's like how is he being reflected in everything? Yeah. And I, it's just such a bizarre experience to have that person yeah. be the president. And why doesn't that bother hardcore right wing people? It when should the, bother a lot of people. It, like, why don't they look at that and go, just as a human being, like, I got a bad feeling about this guy. Right. You know, what does it take for them to go? I got a bad feeling that this guy isn't worried about me. Yeah. And I don't think that he, that he is. I don't. I I think that he. Uh, I like, think he lives in his own dimension. Like Nixon, who has some similarities to mm -hmm. Trump, but always was very good at publicly, at least pretending yeah. he was the president and he was trying to yeah. do the right thing. And then behind the scenes, that's when yeah. he was dangerous. It's also all so transparent. That's what's so. I think crazy making when you say I don't want anyone from these countries to come in because they might be terrorists, but we'll let all the Saudi Arabians in 
Now, I'm not saying we, we should bar any country, but even w but when your logic makes no sense yeah. of which countries can't come in and which can. But you're meeting with the Russians. What's that? But he's meeting, and he's meeting with the Russians. Like, what about that part? I would say they might be a threat. How, how about the fact that Comey said that Trump never once asked for information about Russian interference in the election? And what about that Jeff Sessions said yeah. that he never talked about that with Comey? It's so, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the bubbles in LA and New York mm -hmm. and the celebrity factor yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. You were one of the more vocal celebrities. Like, what would you do over again if you could do over the last 24 months? Like, if you're representing all the celebrities, is there a move that should have I don't think celebrities happened? did anything wrong. I, 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 I never believe it. In that part of it, it's an easy thing to say afterwards. Like, yes, I normal agree. people are mad that that star, that TV show, thinks Hillary Clinton sh should have won. Yeah, I don't think people vote based on that. I, 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 I can see people saying, you know, screw you, rich people. But then why not screw you, Trump? Yeah, who's a rich person? So you're going to be mad at George Clooney for his opinion, but be psyched about the guy that hosted The Apprentices. Opinion that there's no logic to it, so I never think much about it. I think that w everyone did stand up, and I think, well, you know, if, if you watch those those debates and were comfortable with Donald Trump being the president, you're getting what you wanted. I watched him and was horrified uh, the, the entire time. I, I, but I knew it was possible because I think he just didn't have a track record. When you have zero track record, it's easy to point to Hillary and, and say you were right about this, you were wrong about this. But Donald, you've been wrong about nothing because you've done nothing for 70 years. Right. Uh, and so, in a way, it's a guy without blemishes and only years of fun entertainment for most people. And that, that helped him. I think it's going to start trickling in the arts within the next year because if you look at how the Nixon mm -hmm. thing played out, yeah. The movies that Hollywood started to make, starting with like yeah. 74, 75, going Parallax through. Parallax View. Yeah, all that stuff. Was, that Redford was in a couple. and Yeah. What was the uh, Redford one where the CIA was trying to With the Three Days of the Condor. Him? A classic. Um, Marathon Man, all these mm -hmm. ones where the government was really yeah. up to stuff and trying to kill our protagonists. And that was seven, eight years of movies. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you had all the Vietnam movies. Yeah. These people coming back from Vietnam. It wasn't what yeah. you think of. these guys were actually the heroes. And the problem is we've made all these movies already. We made a, a face in the crowd, and we've seen being there. So all of these true uh, being there's a good one. You know, entertainers acquiring power movies or network have been made and made very well. But I don't know if anybody learned anything. From My them. guess is that documentaries are going to play a huge factor of the next sure. couple years. I know Michael Moore has one coming out, but I saw Hillary Clinton speak at the Code Conference, and she mentioned how, I think it was on Netflix, she said that like eight of the ten political documentaries were made by the Trump side or the, right, or the you know, what that his side of things, like yes. making Obama look bad or Hillary mm -hmm. or whoever, and she was saying how that was one of the faults of what happened the last couple of years is that it wasn't balanced. Now, if there weren't balance, enough. There was enough hit pieces on the other side. I don't know if that's balanced, but I think that was her yeah. point was that um, one side was just really good at cr crafting a narrative. And yeah, well, they I'm have clear targets. I mean, yeah. you, you know, you have the president or Hillary, those they're, they're clear targets. And so Trump came into the game so late that yeah. people didn't have time to gather this information. And it's funny that you know, people don't get mad that, you know, Mitch McConnell said, let's just make sure Obama never wins no matter what on anything. And for eight years, they just said no to anything he wanted to do. Yeah. And you would think that would enrage people. They would say that's the, our country is about people coming together to solve problems. And people didn't. I and mean, that was a strategy. Yeah. We're just going to hobble him. Cock blocking him. Yeah. And then at the end, they're like, well, he didn't do anything. Well, yeah, he didn't let him do anything for eight years. And now you're saying he didn't do anything. Uh you know, people, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I have some of my best friends voted for Trump. And people, I, I, I was shocked would, would lay out why they, they were doing it. And I think for a lot of people, they don't think of anything beyond just their taxes potentially being lowered. And they think of nothing else. They just go, yeah, I might get another 8%. And, and that is important to people. Uh, but I think that, that, was a massive part of this. Yeah. It was just a very simple new tax cut 
guy. Had that, uh, you know, they came after Lena a bunch mm-hmm. of times, really yeah. for the last couple of years. Yeah. In really vicious ways. Oh, and that's yeah. somebody that you've been. All kind strong of women get protecting. attacked by these people. I mean, that's why when you see them in a room and they're signing a bill about health care, there's never a woman in there. It's, you know, it's men trying to control women's bodies. And the thing they're most scared of in the world is the confident, brilliant, creative woman. I mean, they're, that's, that's, they're terrified. And that's why I, I think they say such outrageous things. They want to destroy that so quickly. I don't even know if they understand why that bothers them so much. Because what, 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 what do people like Lena and, and Amy Schumer really stand for? Equality for women, maybe sane gun laws so that a zillion people don't get killed every day. Not even that much gun control, just how about registration? Yeah. Uh, and a woman's ability to control her own body, right to choose. Amy's another one that got, yeah. she got in the, uh, in the whirlpool. It's an old comedian's you joke. In there. It's an old comedian's joke. But if men could get pregnant, you, you think that, that there would be any issue with, uh, people being allowed to get abortions? She's talking about, yeah. You know, it's, uh, would we ever talk about it in a million years? We we wouldn't. When did your daughter start thinking about this stuff? About the, uh, the control of your own body stuff? Because I have a 12-year-old, and all of a sudden she has opinions on it. And I'm like, where did this come from? Yeah, I guess it is a, you know, it, it's it, you know, it comes when you're I guess when 13, you start 14, thinking, yeah. 15 years old, and someone explains it to you. I was like, a year ago, you were complaining, you complaining about Max and Ruby plots. Now exactly. you're, now you're in Yeah, I, I think... <laughs> It is a new generation, hopefully a much stronger generation. And I think the work that Amy and Lean have done uh, certainly has probably inspired millions of young women to uh, speak up about anything they believe in. But I always laugh about it. You know, when people like say super mean things, I think, wow, how, how, how unhappy are you if you're going to jump online and say something like that? Like you're, you, it's, you, it's you must feel pretty bad about yourself. And it's hard, uh, you know, for anybody to, have to hear any of that um but it really says more about someone that flips out than uh, about lena or amy or anybody else the amy stuff that one was even that one even seemed kind of forced I don't it, know, it, which part it just seemed like they the, the the spotlight was just kind of it's almost like a, outside a penitentiary mm-hmm. where the spotlights roaming around mm-hmm. looking for somebody and then it's like hey there's somebody and it just and everybody start coming after. It's I also didn't totally so understand silly. It. It's also so silly because you know in six months we don't even know if Donald Trump will be the president, but yeah. certainly within two years, two or three years, we'll all agree that that was a terrible, terrible mistake and all the things that people got in trouble for doing or saying in in trying to alert people that we're in a dangerous situation with Trump will all seem justified. Do you worry about free speech at all? And, uh, I, I and do. creativity and just I, all things that we've taken for granted sure. over the years? Sure. I mean, there's a lot of people you talk to now that worry that their phones are bugged and they don't trust him with the uh, national security uh, yeah. powers. Uh, and I think that freedom of speech is... Um, at risk when these mega corporations don't have anything to gain by giving you freedom of speech. Yeah. So it happens, I think, in more insidious ways. Certain movies just aren't green lit because they might uh, bother some people. And I think that's what will happen. You do something too far in one direction or the other, and you can't get it made. Yeah. Uh, and that happens, and no one knows it happened. You know, Seth and Evan make the movie The Interview with a very simple premise, which is North Korea is a bad country led by a bad man. And it reminds people in a very broad comedic way that there are millions of people suffering and starving right now in another country. And so then there's all this controversy about it. And then you think, well, what movie are they not going to green light now because they don't want that controversy? Yeah, and then what do we do? Not say North Korea is bad, so suddenly there's another way we don't talk about it, or just in the way that they try to ha- make everything equal, like just having Jeffrey Lord on CNN every night. I I watch that and I think, oh, they're just trying to show both sides, but it really isn't. It's just uh, propaganda. It's not. I, I mean, I like when there's a good Republican who can, 
you know, senator or congressman who could stand up for a position, but the, the paid surrogates who are just clowns and sometimes on both, both sides, you go, why is he there? He never has anything insightful to say. He never has new information. I know he's going to agree with Trump on every single thing. I mean, if a third of the time he was like, I don't know what the fuck he's talking about on this one, he, he might be worth having, but he never ever does. And why does CNN keep him there? Because he's kind of amusing. I mean, he looks like he should be at the bar on Cheers. Right. And that is why he's there. He's like a weird, goofy, idiot, telegenic guy who does not have an opinion of his own. It would be like if ESPN was showing the NBA playoffs and just had two people, one who hated LeBron yes. and one who defended everything about him. And just every episode of the studio show, yeah. they would just get in an argument with the same beats. And LeBron uh, might play bad one day, and then you would have the guy who was his best friend explain why he played good. Right. No, he wasn't bad. <laughs> I know he missed a lot of shots, but yeah. he did this, 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 this. And, and that's what we watch all day. And uh, it's funny because we, you know, we have our movie coming out, The Big Sick, right? And, yeah. And it's you know, Kamel Nanjiani, Holly Hunter, and Ray Romano. It comes out in New York and L.A., I guess. It'll be like this Friday, and then a couple of weeks later, everywhere. And when we started it, it, you know, there was an element of a guy who was an immigrant, you know, falling in love, and his mom wants an arranged marriage, and then the the, the American woman he falls in love with gets sick and has to be put into a coma. And it's like this weird movie about this guy waiting for his girlfriend to wake up from a coma while being stuck with her parents. And yeah. it's very sweet and hilarious, and and it wasn't meant to be political in any way, but in this new environment. All of a sudden, it's political. It's political. Why? Because we're humanizing Muslim people yeah. in America and showing that they're just like you and they just want happiness and love and connection. Appetite. Pro Muslim. <laughs> it's Big a headline. So it's, it's a weird and, and it's a beautiful movie. And I think it really reminds people that all these people who come to this country, they come here because they love it. And uh, just because there's a few extreme people out there doesn't mean that the millions of other people aren't amazingly great people. Yeah. And so this sweet movie suddenly is making a statement when we, I mean, we made it before any of this happened, right. but it's, it's a sad reminder that there's a lot of people who, who will just say, yeah, keep them all out. That's like if we all had to leave every time a white guy kills somebody. Well, we got all the white people should leave America yeah. because some, extremist on the other side did something uh so it's very sad i've seen it up close you know you, you i i never think about it but when you, you talk to people like kamal and aziz they say yeah no people they get hassled they this is an everyday thing people looking at you funny people judging because of uh something that is incredibly rare and comes from ex extreme people yeah um it's like if you judge me because of the Jews who throw rocks at you if you drive a car on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Quick break to talk about Hotel Tonight. If you're like me and you are not so great at planning ahead, I've got good news for you. There's an awesome app called Hotel Tonight that helps you find amazing hotel deals at the last minute. Unlike flights, hotel rates usually get cheaper at the last minute. Hotel Tonight helps hotels sell their unsold room. Zuh. Room zuh. Allowing them to pass those deals along to you, not for last resort places, but cool top rated hotels, even five star hotels for Joe House. Hotel Tonight has over 50,000 awesome partner hotels in 36 countries. Perfect for a spontaneous getaway or a staycation that you've wanted for a while, or in House's case, a five star hotel. Even though the app's name is Hotel Tonight, you can book up to a week in advance. All it takes is 10 seconds, just three taps and a swipe. Get in on these killer last-minute deals. Download the Hotel Tonight app right now. It's great. You'll love it. It's great for the last-minute things. Put in the city. Hotel rooms pop up. You find out that somebody has the penthouse suite available at the last minute. You can impress your girlfriend, your wife, your boyfriend, your husband, whatever. Hotel Tonight. Check it out. Back to Judd Apatow. How do you decide which projects now? So it seems like you just uh, for me float around. I can't. You, you, there's no strategy anymore. You just say, "Oh, I like that person. Oh, I like this," and you just yeah. float to the different projects. I just, you know, whatever's amusing me. Uh, you know, when I hear it, I don't. I. I it is. It is. It's, it's like being a fan of sports, except I'm interested in creative people, 
and I'll meet someone and go, oh my god, that that person seems like they have amazing ideas, and yeah, and you 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 might meet someone and think, I'd love to see a Kamel Nanjiani movie. Yeah, I think that'd be incredible. Uh, and then you realize that you have to make it <laughs> if you if you want to see it. It's not out there. And you know, the same with someone like Amy. I just heard her on the radio and thought, this is a movie. Everything she's talking about, I can see it. It's a movie. And uh, but I'm not like actively trying to watch anything or meet anybody. Just it just strikes you every once in a while. So you're like on YouTube. Yeah, I'm not We're flicking channels. I'm not like Scooter Braun looking for <laughs> Justin Bieber. Uh, I, I just uh, will meet someone, and then usually I feel like the universe just keeps bringing them in front of you. I well, met- you must. You're at the point now where you people are probably trying to get your attention. I'm sure. Well, I, or through a friend of a friend or whatever. Yeah, but so much less than you would expect. Yeah. <laughs> you you would think that, that that a lot of people would be trying to pitch things, but it, it's not that bad. Thank God, because I really don't want to do that much generally i'm not trying to do that much but every once in a while there's something that you like but it always so seems like you're doing something yeah i mean and something always fills the time you're failing on that strategy <laughs> if you're trying not to do too much yeah something fills the time like now i'm doing this uh, stand-up comedy tour um oh yeah and i'm gonna do a netflix special some dates to rattle off uh, yeah talk about this. end talk of july about- i'll be at just for laughs if uh, you should get tickets now because uh there's only uh, 95% of the tickets available. <laughs> no, <there's, laughs> no, no. I'm going to be in Montreal at the end of July, and then also I'm at the Wilbur in Boston doing a couple of shows. Uh, and one of them, we're going to give all the money away to, to after-school arts programs in Boston. And then I'm going to be in Ridgefield, Connecticut at the end of July also. I got Washington 20 and 21st July. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, and the 22nd, the Ridgefield, Connecticut, 23rd, Boston, 24th, Providence, 25th, and then Montreal, 28th, 29th. Yeah, and so, and that's the thing I've been enjoying the most is just doing stand up and being. Yeah, you made in the, the last time you did the pod when I brought the pod mm-hmm. back. I think October 2015, yeah. you were like the fifth guest. Yes, and we were talking about you dabbling back into stand up and. Oh, I love it! It's really reigniting it. Is- it. Yeah, it's also fun to just be around everyone. There's so many creative people around. When you make movies, you wind up just alone in your room all the time. Yeah. You don't meet anybody. You don't with meet other one directors. Editor. With one one sweaty editor. And you, and you just... Who's always eating chicken. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then you go, oh, I need to be around people. And and it's fun. You go to the Comedy Cellar in New York, and Chappelle walks in, and Louis, and Amy. Yeah. And, and I, I think it really... It makes you want to be funnier. Because you're, when you see funny people up close... You think I gotta work harder? Look at look how hard Aziz is working on his act. Yeah, I mean there's some killers out there, and I think people don't notice. I mean, I guess they shouldn't. These people work their asses off on these sets, right? For years they grind so hard, uh, and it, it seems effortless, but they're in there killing themselves, and uh, it's really fun. I had Aziz on the pod last month, and he was talking about. Just how inspired he was to go to some of these clubs some nights, yeah. and Chappelle walks in, and Rock's working on something. Sure. Just these guys who have had hit every checkpoint of success you can have, and they're still grinding away at one in the morning yeah. at some club, That's trying what, to get the wording of one joke right. It's always, I mean, because you're always happy anytime a joke works. Yeah, it doesn't matter if there's four people there, or a lot of people there. <laughs> right. Like, oh my god, I thought of this joke and it worked, and you're so happy. Is that why you you want to do crashing? Because it seems like yeah. that's like the the bare bones of that thing. Like he's at some points he's talking to three people. Yeah, I mean Pete Holmes, you know, told me this story about you know his his wife cheated on him and he was doing a little stand up, but then he he had to do it full time because he, he she was kind of supporting him. Yeah, she, she, and uh, and so I thought that was a funny idea for a show, and we did the first season. People liked it. We're shooting the second season. Yeah, now. And, uh, yeah, it forces me to be in the clubs and to know what's going on. And Pete is so funny. Uh, so it's a thrill. We're about to do a whole bunch of new ones. Bill Burr is doing one. And What do the comedians think of this show? Comedians like it, and comedians hate anything about comedy. I know. I was going to yeah. say. They're a very, very touchy audience. <laughs> Anytime you show stand-up comedy or a club, comedians are like, that's not what it is. Right. Uh, but, you know, we we try to make it as documentary feeling as you can when we get near the clubs. Yeah. Uh, and just, if we're in the comedy cellar one night and we see a bunch of people hanging out, you know, and two weeks later we might go, just get those four people. 
from that night, and it'll it'll feel like the comedy cellar. Right. And the big sick, the guy's a comedian too. He is. He is. Yeah. And that's funny. And then we, funny we, people, the guy was a comedian too. What are you trying to tell us? I'm saying it's maybe the only job I can write for. <laughs> I, I I can never write like a wizard or something. I can never I can never really write Financial about things. Analyst. Yeah. If I if I don't do it in life, I can't do it. I can't write a doctor. I I. I recently figured out... A dad out, with two kids could be your next movie? I, yeah, but if it was three kids, I could not do it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, I reached the limits of my imagination. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. The I, Showtime show, which I watched the first one of, about 70s comedy. Yes. And it it makes the... I actually thought it was a pretty cool show, but it makes the cardinal mistake mm -hmm. of the actual comedy is not funny. Mm -hmm. It's the old Studio 60 conundrum of... It's a sketch show, and these guys are geniuses, yeah. but then the sketches aren't that good, and you it, it you can't buy it, but yet in any other genre, I would buy mm -hmm. it. When we do our show, we, you know, one of the fun things about it is we, we'll just, you know, need some comedy, and we'll just say, oh, let's just have Dan Natterman do his act. Yeah. And, and, uh... And that's uh, it's fun to just showcase people and go. You know, it's hilarious. It's Greer Barnes. Right. Let's just show Greer Barnes here. Uh, I, I like that the show exists just for that opportunity to to just anyone you like who's working a club, you could chuck them into the show. Somewhere. Can you believe what's happened to comedy? Where net, yeah, Netflix basically just say we're going to take this whole genre, except for we're take ninety percent of the genre. Yeah. And if we have, if there's any big comic who's yeah. thinking of a special, here's the biggest check you've ever thought yeah. you would get in your life for it. Well, the world, I mean, all of it has changed because there used to be no financial incentive for good television. Yeah. It was all lowest common denominator. It was all trying to get everybody to watch. Hey, they, it's still that case on some networks. Don't, sure. don't yeah, rule exactly. out some of the networks. It, 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 there's They're some, still some the lowest common denominator. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I, I guess more more uh, in your streaming uh, yes. cable world. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so now when you pitch things, people want them even deeper and weirder. Yeah. And, and if, you know, if you go pitch something to Netflix or HBO – if you're not groundbreaking and buzzworthy, to them I think it's about like buzz and awards. But thank God it also means do something that has never been done before, yeah. do something that really matters to you. So you don't get the same old stuff. You wind up getting whatever, Game of Thrones, Stranger Things, or you know whatever movie came on five, whatever show came on five minutes ago. Every day there's a new show. It's uh, every day. It's like every yeah. six hours. Yeah. <laughs> 2000, 2000 era Judd would have enjoyed this era, I feel like. I, I think I, Freaks and Geeks definitely would have gotten like uh, a three-year commitment. I would have been I think nice. we talked about this last time, but it is, it's just funny. Like There's yeah. certain shows from last decade that yeah. would have been consumed completely differently. Well, well, the numbers, Friday Night Lights is a great example. The too. numbers of Freaks and Geeks, in today's numbers, it would have been a mega hit based on how many people were oh, watching yeah. it. I mean, I think seven million people were watching every episode of Freaks and Geeks, and that was a disaster. Right. Uh, I mean, that was Friday Night Lights. Was like that too. It was like six million people. This is yeah. this is we can't keep this. Yeah. Well, what now do you, it'd be like the nineteenth highest show. What do you watch? What's your main binge show? It, it depends. There's like the family binge shows. Like mm -hmm. we we banged out Riverdale. Yeah. We I banged out yet. 13 Reasons Why, which was probably five reasons too long. Okay. But, um, I haven't watched that yet. Usually the binge watch shows are too long. Yes. They, it's it's almost like the uh, the object of just editing and maybe mm -hmm. trying to be around the right length. It does, just doesn't matter. Yeah. It's like, we do 13 of these. Great. Do it. Do mm -hmm. all of them. Like, yeah. I don't know. That show could have been eight. But, um, but some of them are not meant to be watched so quickly. No, but I think you can tell some are now designed because they'll have the little cliffhanger at the end. Yeah. <laughs> but I just mean, do you really want to watch that many hours of the same thing? I mean, it's, I always thought it was fun that Girls was on one week and you would think about it and talk about it a little bit. Well, we're old school, though, because I agree yeah. with you. I like the digesting and the comeback, yeah. but I think the binge watch. It's funny, my dad, who's somehow never saw Game of Thrones, and I finally convinced him yeah. to watch it. And he's watched three seasons in two weeks. Yeah. But he's 69, so it's a lot of he's stuff like, else to how do about right that now? guy who has sex with his sister lost his hand? And, you know, it's a lot of like, he doesn't know anyone's name. But you don't remember But he's anything. binge watching it. I mean, you can't remember it. It's like, we'll watch like season two of Narcos. Yeah. And we'll be like, let's go <laughs> Who's that guy? a good guy or a bad guy? Are we rooting for him? Are we not rooting for him? Or... Right. We were watching Broadchurch season two. Very good show, Broadchurch. We got 
I swear to God, eight episodes in, and I turned to my wife and I went, we watched this five months ago. And, we had, <laughs> no. we, and it took us eight episodes <laughs> to realize we had already watched those eight. That's how, that's how bad it is. We watched season one of Bloodline. And I think we watched it like two nights, me and my wife. And then when season two came out, we didn't know who any of the characters were. No, it's it, like, it just kind of goes in one it's ear It's like out putting the down other. a book. It's like trying to read War and Peace and dropping it for a week. And yeah, going, yeah, it's not I don't to know do what is happening. It's too much stuff. It's too much content. Yeah. And it's hard for me, you know, as someone who makes that content, you have a weird relationship with the audience because the audience is moving through so much shit. Right. That you don't feel like you've had that much of an impact in their lives. And they're probably doing a second thing as they're watching your show. Like <laughs> they're, they're loading up Hulu yeah. as your Netflix show is they're ending. They're definitely doing two things. <laughs> they're on Twitter, they're on Snapchat, whatever, as they're yeah. watching your show that you slaved over for a year and a half. Because you know, we do love for Netflix, and we do design it uh, with the belief that people are going to watch it in two sittings. Yeah. That, that's what we always assume. That people will watch so five. Need two, four, or five, five <laughs> yeah, hours yeah. or four. Yeah, that probably people, most people are going to watch it in two, three max. Um, but, you know, you drop it, and then for a few weeks people talk about it, and then you, it's like you're not having a conversation with the audience. And the truth is, I think more people are watching it than other things and in other eras. But Especially in other countries, too. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you're not having a conversation with anyone. Like the the way you used to interact with the audience has changed, and I don't think it's necessarily worse. It's just different, and it throws you if you're used to feeling like you impact the culture in some way. Yeah, I think Game of Thrones. You could argue might be the last significant. Everyone enjoys it at the same time on the yeah. same night and then thinks about it for the yeah. next couple of days and then gets ready to do it again. I don't, I don't know if there's ever going to be another show like that. And I don't know if it's bad. It's just. I think it's strange. partly bad. Yeah. I, lo I love the whole concept of finishing a show and then talking about it with people I yeah. like and then reading stuff about it and hear, you know, people experiencing it as I experienced it. But if you really sports is like that, right? Yeah. You watch the, you watch game four of the finals and you go through it and it's live and yeah. you figure I mean, it out. After. I, I remember when the Sopranos on after every episode, I would call Jake Kasdan and we would talk about it for an hour. Just like recap. It. But it was just one guy. I guess I could find find other people. Find one guy to talk about a whole season of the show. That's what I mean is I don't know if it's good or bad. It's just it's, it's just, just an different. adjustment. Uh, it is like the adjustment of making movies for streaming services. Yeah. You know, we made the Pee Wee Herman movie and it was on Netflix and people really liked it, but you just didn't feel it in, in some way when maybe more people watch that than almost any movie I've made probably. But where do I talk to anybody <laughs> about it? Right. Uh, it, it's just, a, it's an odd feeling. I think a lot of filmmakers are adjusting to it because there's great things about it too, which is a lot of cool things are going to get made and are getting made. Because of this need for content. And, and so, a lot of bad things, too. Uh, a lot of bad a, things. Yeah, we made, except we've, a lot of wild swings and misses and then some swings and hits. But a, but a shot, I, I would say this, as someone who's hated network TV development my whole life, yeah. railed against the nightmare of the notes process and how they water everything down and ruin everything, I think that like the Netflix success rate is so high creatively, it is, it's such an argument against everything network tv does and how they develop well, they've programming done, they've done one thing that is near and dear to both yeah. of our hearts they pick people they want to work with and then just let them go yeah they're like for better or worse yeah. here's some money go do your thing yeah you're, i mean it's great to not feel like you're gonna get canceled in the middle of your season or you're gonna get notes yeah. from people who doesn't know who the fuck you are yeah. Or doesn't understand what you're trying to do. Well, Network hey, TV, get rid of that character. Network TV is like making TV with a gun to your head because yeah. they do have this thing, which is I could stop you from shooting at any moment. Yeah. So if I say add three hot girls and you go, what? That doesn't even make sense. They basically have a gun in your mouth. Yeah. Where <laughs> with Netflix, they give you a season and they're irrational. And then at the end of the season, they let you know if they want to do another season. But you don't have that terror like, oh, my God, we lost last night because we were up against the Tonys, and now you're worried your show's going to get canceled. Yeah. It's nice not to live uh, under that shadow. Of the movies you made, what one would have been better as an eight-hour season one of a Netflix series? Uh, well, I think This is 40 w would be a, a great series. Um, 
Uh, you could, plus you could have done the tearjerker yeah. version of it, like this is us and gone for the 20 million people. I, or a I could week. have done the, uh, this is one direction and, and see, this is, is a very popular this thing. This is good. But yeah. we stole it from This is Spinal Tap and I think This is Spinal Tap stole it from like, yeah, some World War II documentary or something. Is so this, this is this 40. Is, this is Radio Europe, or isn't there some other... Uh, so this, this is, is 40, 10 episodes. That would have been good. Um, what else? You could have done about 85 episodes of Walk Hard. <laughs> but show his whole life in real time, which I would have enjoyed. <laughs> I want to make all of them series. That's why my movies are so long. I mean, when, when, <laughs> you're a frustrated <laughs> TV series maker. Yeah, for me, like love is just a you know a five hour movie. I I finally got in the time because it's weird because in a the movie theater people do get annoyed at a certain length, and I'm I'm always shocked that people will sit through a superhero movie that's almost three hours. Right. But you make another genre movie and it's like an hour and 58 and people are losing their minds. I think it's because they have to pee. I think it's all about pee timings because when you're home. You can pause, and people want to be able to pause. And so in a movie theater, there's a moment where people are like, it's been too long since I peed. And for the last 25 minutes of your movie, they're mainly thinking about that they have to pee. But at home, they can watch the, 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 you know, the, the OJ documentary in one sitting because there are pee breaks. So my only counter to that would be if, if it's a kid's movie or a superhero movie or whatever. It's really nice to get out of there in two hours from start mm -hmm. to finish. Yeah. I always, when like we go to see what generic superhero movie du yeah. jour, and you look and it's the runtime's two hours and nineteen minutes, yeah. and you know you have a five year old, and you know there's gonna be fifteen yes. minutes of previews, and it's just like you start doing the math and you're like, I'm yeah. I'm fucked. This Why is are you bringing the, the five year old movie. to the Dark Knight? What are you doing? Which, that's true, baby. That's a mistake. <laughs> but I remember seeing Sully last year, and it was like mm -hmm. a minute twenty nine. Or hour twenty nine, yeah. and it was just like, all right, it's not like a friend, really fast, yeah. <laughs> great. Yeah. So I think there's room for both, but you and I are yeah. aligned because I mean everything I've written has probably been twenty five percent too long. I was like, ah, I this, never think things are too long if I like them. Yeah, like if someone called me and said, "Hey, the OJ doc, they found three more hours." They, they, there, was a, there was another three hours right. they cut out. I, I literally would be running home to watch right. it. Right. You want more? I, if, if I like it. Um, but, you know, I, like, for instance, I'm doing a documentary about Gary Shandling for HBO right now. I was right now. ready to talk about that. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're approaching it like the Eagles documentary or, you know, the Grateful Dead documentary. There's, uh, you know, a great story to tell. And when you don't feel the need to do it in 90 minutes, you, you're, you don't have to, like, cut out of every moment in four seconds you could actually show what what something felt like if you're showing the first time you did the tonight show you don't show one joke and move on you could actually show a minute of it and yeah. and give people a real feel for things hey quick break to talk about guess what massages everyone loves massages it is always hard to book one well what if you could book a five-star top quality massage at a time that works for you in the most convenient place of all your home Check out zeal.com, same day in home massages with the best licensed and vetted massage therapists on demand at home. Z E E L dot com. Download the iPhone or Android app, select the massage therapist, choose your favorite technique, gender preference, time, location, you're off. They can be there in less than an hour. Schedule booking payment fast and easy. Even the tip is included. No money changes hands. It costs on average 20 to 50% less than going to a local spa or hotel. And if you're stressed out and you're not a believer in the occasional massage, um, you're making a mistake because nothing relaxes you and gets your head in the right place better than a good massage. Guess what? Our listeners get $25 off their first massage by using their promo code BS at checkout. Sign up for Zeal's massage membership. membership. Massage membership. That's a tough one. Sign up for Zeal's massage membership. I got it. Get 20% off all your massages plus a free massage table and sheet set. That's a $388 value. Yours free. No initiation fee to join the membership. Just go to zeel.com or on Zeal's iPhone or Android app. Make sure you click add promo code at checkout. Use my code BS. Get $25 off your first in-home on-demand massage. Back to Jed Apatow. So... When you came on in October 2015, mm -hmm. which I think was the last time you were on, mm -hmm. and we talked about Shanley. Yes. And I and we talked about him for 10 minutes, and then you told me that I was like, yeah, I, I, I want to go see him. And, I haven't, I haven't, you, and yeah. you were like, go see him. And then yeah. a couple months later, he, you know. 
Um, but then you, you ran the memorial service, mm-hmm. which, um, I was grateful you invited me to. And it was one of the coolest nights I can remember. And I'm sure people still mention it to you. It yeah. was as good of a celebration of anyone that I've ever seen. But it started out with this great moment with, uh, Jeffrey Tambor mm-hmm. and Beverly from Larry's show. Oh, Penny. What's Penny? Um, and they're doing this sketch in character as the Larry Sanders characters, but then they break character near the end, and Jeffrey Tambor as Hank just gets upset about mm-hmm. um, Sh- uh, Shanling, and it was uh, it was super emotional in the room. It really was. I mean, it was uh, it was just perfect. And then you had all these people come out giving speeches, and you're like, the fucking security guard's gonna give a speech. This is gonna mm-hmm. be terrible. And then he's great. Mm-hmm. And it was just awesome. I've never seen anything like it. It was really memorable. And now you're doing yeah. the documentary. Yeah, I, I, you know, the docu- documentary was a, something that came out of the memorial because uh, when we were putting the mo- memorial together, we said, well, let's 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 edit together some little documentary pieces for the memorial. And we 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 got everybody to give us all the footage of Gary. Yeah, all his Tonight Show sets and Letterman appearances and obscure things and it was just such a treasure trove you forget how much comedy these people write right. in their lives you know gary might you know have some appearance from letterman from 2008 that no one on earth remembers but when you rewatch it you go that might be the funniest five minutes of panel i've ever seen in my life yeah. and I, I always feel bad just as a bit of a hoarder that people don't have access to see those things or don't know they should see them so a documentary is a great way also, to just show the work, because you, you might forget, oh, he did a Bill Maher appearance during the OJ trial, where I've never seen anybody more on fire and insightful and hysterical. Yeah. Uh, that we found a clip of Donald Trump filling in for Regis interviewing Gary. What? Uh, uh, on Regis and Kelly. Donald Trump filled in for Regis on Regis and Kelly? Yeah. And, and it's just, <laughs> it's just amazing to see the look in Gary's eyes. Not knowing what to do with this human being. Just looking at him like, what, what is happening in front of me here right now? Before he was a politician, just as a human being, just thrown by the, the strangeness of it. What do you think Gary would have thought of that memorial service? I think he would have loved it. Gary was trying to figure out a way to talk a little bit more about his spirituality. You know, he was interested in Buddhism and, 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 you know, really believed in all these ideas that he wrote about in Larry Sanders, you know, about trying to drop your ego and non-attachment and, yeah. and it was a struggle for him, but he, he, he was, he was seeking, uh, you know, a quieter, life and a quieter mind and 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 had been his entire life you know um and so i think the memorial expressed that and he talks about it a little bit in comedians in cars uh, right which was like his last great yes thing that he did on video i think right yeah i think that he found a way to show who he was at that stage of his life it's really funny but very, very revealing. The reactions he got from Seinfeld, too, is just like pure yeah. pure comedy joy. Oh, like just sure. Seinfeld. It seems like that was the recurring thing with him, how much other comedians mm-hmm. got a kick out of him. He has to be like yeah. in the top five of being able to make other comedians just laugh. I think comedians know how ingeniously funny he was, what a craftsman he was. Yeah. And, you know, he reinvented TV two times. Right. Uh, with its Gary Shanley show and the Larry Sanders show. And, and I mean, he completely changed television. At HBO, when you talk to the heads of HBO, what they say is... Oh, they're super indebted. Yeah, they say the, that the Larry Sanders show told them what HBO should be. Yeah. That that's how big an impact it was. And I, uh, someone said that David Chase wrote The Sopranos after watching the Larry Sanders show. Huh. Because he said, oh, we're allowed to do this now? Right. Uh, and... I think that you know everything we do: girls, flea bag, uh, curb your enthusiasm, the office, all of these things. They're they're all influenced by Gary. Gary really showed people like I agree with a that. new path. I, as somebody who grew up with HBO, it was movies and comedy specials and boxing. Yes, for years. Yeah, and then some shows that weren't very good. Mm-hmm. You know, and and then then uh, Sanders was on. 
and by like 95, 96, it was like if you cared at all about comedy or being funny yeah. or anything, um, you've, you had to either get HBO or have a buddy who had HBO if you're in yeah. your 20s or 30s. Mm -hmm. You just had to. You had to get yeah. it. And it was like this, this show happening not on the network that you had to see. And then that led to everything else. I always thought it was the first really important HBO show that had to be seen. Yeah, and then it then it goes to Sex and the City and Sopranos, and then Oz, and they're off. But and it was you know. weird at the time. Oh, it's half on video, it's half on film. Right. Uh, you have all these celebrities playing. Is he parroting themselves. Letterman? Is this him? Yeah. yeah, there's and and people forget Gary was the the main guest host of the Tonight Show. Yeah. When Johnny wasn't there, him and Leno would would alternate. Yeah. And Gary got busy doing It's Gary Shanley's show and said, I can't do both. And he gave up hosting The Tonight Show. And it would have been interesting to see who they picked if he went for it. I don't know the uh, answer to that. Yeah. I would say it's like a dead even battle. I think I think Shanley probably had more gravitas at that point. Yeah, it's hard to know. I, I, he, he did get offered all of the 1230 slots. Yeah. Uh, and Which he wisely turned down. He, he wanted to satirize... Right, the world of late night more than just do it. Yeah, but I, I think that he also didn't like the idea of working every day. Yeah. That, that it was the type of job you would take on, and it would mean you've made a commitment to do a job for the rest of your life. And I think that also bothered him. It's a tough one to binge because I've had some young people that work for me. They watch yeah. it, or in you know the first season and a half, yeah. the two seasons of the show are so different than where the show got to. Yes, yes. And he had wives it, in the first two years, and it never was that logical. And I always thought that Gary was trying to work something out on the show. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, right. this is a type of relationship I should be in, and, and to try to write it. But it's uh, also tough to tell somebody just jump into season three. It's not like season one and season two weren't worth watching, but yeah. the good stuff is starts with season three. Yes. That's when it really becomes the show that it is. And... I don't. I don't know what I would recommend. I mean, I would recommend people go from start yeah. to finish. But if I, I think some people watch season one and they, they they don't quite get it why it became what it was. Well, I also think it's not the type of show you really should be watching three or four in a row. Like no. Nah. Like if I watch Larry Sanders, I don't want to watch another one. Right I would watch after. the roast three or four times yeah. in a row. By its, I mean, just watch that over and over. Yeah. Again. But yeah, that's one thing I've been for. looking for the episode where they roast Larry. Uh, the the dailies. I haven't been able to find the dailies because I think they just roasted him for hours and hours and hours. Oh, sir, you think uh, they like ad lib it? <laughs> well, I think people wrote long speeches and then they cut them down. I'd I, I, I'd love to see see that the dailies, but I, I don't I don't have them. So that could have been like a two and a half hour show. Oh yeah, I did. Yeah, there's a funny thing online, which is Richard Pryor had a sketch show. And it got canceled. So for the last episode, they just did a roast of Richard Pryor. And the ro the people roasting were, was just the cast. And I, they must have just wanted to do a cheap show or something. Yeah. And, and, but the cast was Sandra Bernhardt and Marshall Warfield and Robin Williams and Tim so Reed. Is this like mid-70s? Yeah. Uh, and, and it's online. Someone put up the raw footage of it. And it's just them roasting Richard Pryor. And Richard Pryor's taking notes the whole time. And then he gets up at the end. And he's ten times funnier than all of them and destroys them and is way meaner meaner than they expect. Oh yeah. He comes back at them hard. Like they're still kissing his ass a bit. And he is not. <laughs> right. <laughs> One more break to talk about credit wise from Capital One. Credit is like a golf major. It's all about how well you perform against the factors that go into a credit score. How good are you at paying your bills on time? I'm actually pretty good because my wife does it. How much credit do you have spread across different accounts? I can't even imagine. How long have those accounts been open? For me, a long time, but I'm old. All of these factors impact your credit health, and since there is no one single score that lenders use, knowing these factors are key. Credit-wise, lets you track the factors that make up your credit health using information from your TransUnion Credit Report. The app can help you spot errors or identify theft lays out information you need to understand your behaviors and how they impact your credit health. Plus, check it anytime without negatively impacting your credit. And the best part, 100% free. Oh, yeah, for everybody. Whether you're a Capital One customer or not, step up your game. Download CreditWise today. And we are going back right now to Jet Apatow. Well, you and I, we both go on YouTube deep dives every once in a while. And the 70s roasts 
when yes. when nothing was politically correct mm-hmm. is an unbelievable deep dive. Yeah, if you ever really want to have your jaw drop a couple times. Yeah, I, I lately I've been more into searching for things on YouTube. I go through periods where I'm into it, I'm not into it. I'll, I'll look up authors speaking at colleges. What? That's a fun one. You could just pick an author. Let's go, John Updike. And then there's hundreds of lectures and Q&As w- with guys like that. And current authors. All authors do tons of interviews on video. So if you like anybody, if you just... I had no idea. You know, about politics, you know, people write, you know, nonfiction books about anything. That That's a fun uh, deep dive. Or Fainting Goats. Fainting Goats. You know, you could, you know... What's that noise? Yeah, no, it's what oh. I'm to figure out. Or Emu Attacks. <laughs> emu Attacks. I like any, like, version of Taurus being attacked by large birds. It's amazing how much mm-hmm. is on YouTube now. Like you could yeah, just put everything. in Robin Williams, nineteen seventy six, yeah. and just stuff comes up. Yeah, and it's like here's this thing you did here, and here's him in Comedy Central with somebody filming with an eight millimeter camera. And- no, I, I I did notice that recently. Like, wow, people have uploaded everything now. It, right. it is all. I, sometimes I'll look up like Judd Apatow Brazil interview to just see if some interview I gave <laughs> for Forty Year Old Virgin ten years ago Judd Apatow is naked. there. Yeah, you know? like and they they are all there. Uh, and I love the the weird obscure rock documentaries. Like this morning, I just looked up Neil Young, and there was some BBC massive documentary about Neil Young I had never heard about before. The BBC has quietly done documentaries on everybody who was yeah. ever good at music. It seems like. Yeah. What the hell is that noise? You got a bird. I think the bird is attacking this place. It might be a woodpecker. Now, did you guys all just get back from the the, the finals? I uh, oh yeah, we should talk about that because your best yeah. friend LeBron lost again. I I, I, I he feel like do he's. It. I thought he was going to do it. You you guys aren't in <laughs> you guys aren't in the same aren't in the same friendship since you did the movie. You I know, feel like he's not keep, leaning on you as much. It's hard to keep those friendships alive. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, to, I'm, it's I, hard to stay in constant contact with the most famous athlete we have know, right now. I'm talking to LeBron and Romney Malco about the same amount right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although I went on vacation to Hawaii and LeBron was there with his family. Uh, and he could not have been nicer and cooler. Well, he came off great in your movie. He actually was a good actor. Oh, my God. He's so For funny. Athlete, the athlete-actor scale is like it's 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 definitely yeah. on a curve, but he was up there. And that's not spoon-fed. That's just him actually being funny and yeah. me being relieved that I don't need to do any work. Right. Uh, I mean, he got that joke. He, he is – I mean, what do you make of the these guys who seem to reach a, some higher level – of existence lebron it's like you could say the same thing about like springsteen yeah they're like in flow it's just one name uh yeah and they're so creative uh, uh, and so like like federer or, or something but they're also great people and it, it's an int- there's a, like a group of them you, you might even see like jay-z is one of these people i went to a, a video shoot uh that a, a guy i knew was directing and and he goes, oh, have you ever met Jay-Z? I'm like, no. And he's like, oh, come say hi. He's just a nice guy. I sit down. There's no one in the room. So it's a very it's a funny thing. And I sit down. And then the, the, the video's delayed. So suddenly I'm just sitting with Jay-Z for hours. And maybe his manager pops in. And there's this, this artist was there. But it's never more than four people. He's about to shoot a music video for Picasso Baby, which they then chucked me into the video. Oh. I've never seen a guy more relaxed. He's getting calls from Beyonce, and I, he, he did, I've never seen someone with so little stress who was so amiable and smart and funny. And I thought, how, do, how does this happen? And you get that from other people, like spring scenes like that too, where I've only briefly met him, but you feel a certain positive, just creative know. energy coming. I, from I guess he wrote a whole book about depression. Maybe they're all. I'm crying inside. <laughs> now that I think about it, I think LeBron's really depressed. Because uh, Springsteen's book is all about that he was depressed and he had anxiety, and that's why he liked to stay on stage. Because his dad was mean to him when he was growing up. I yeah. mean, that was like his first four years, four albums, at least had one song about something with that, right? And that he felt his dad was having some mental struggles as well. But 
Do you see that? You meet all the athletes. Do you see something different in certain people that can perform at that level? I, you know, I think most of them are really afraid to be candid, which is why I, I've, I've done three podcasts now with Durant, mm -hmm. who, for whatever reason, is just candid in them and yeah. doesn't just kind of lets it fly and is just honest. <laughs> And I think that athletes that we have today are just very conditioned to not give a lot out because they've been burned and they, they yeah. just, the repercussions if something goes wrong, isn't worth it. So they're just yeah. very careful. LeBron is somebody that, first of all, the way he's handled the last 15 years is extraordinary. He's yeah. been from the moment he was 17 was really famous you know he was a high school player yeah. they're showing ga his games on espn and then he goes to the Cavs. he wins rookie yeah. of the year and it just goes up and up and yeah. he, his profile goes higher and everyone's picking him apart he just kept coming back it's pretty crazy he's never had never really had a scandal yeah. the worst thing that's ever happened to him was the decision yeah. which really wh who cares it's some reality tv show that yeah. people got mad about but um i think when you look at him compared to other celebrities, I'm not even talking athletes. Mm -hmm. Like it's usually going to go wrong when somebody becomes that famous at yeah. 18. Like people have trouble becoming famous when they're 35. You know, so I think I think that I don't know if he gets enough credit for that. Oh, um, I mean, just this. I mean, just performing under. And pressure. then the other stuff, yeah, and that he keeps getting better and. Because um, it, 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 it plays tricks on you. I, I interviewed Jim Carrey for the Carrey Shandling documentary the other day, and he said people don't really understand. You know, in a moment, your whole life changes from you watching the world to the world watching you. Yeah. And uh, I'm fascinated by the people who handle it well and have the mental foundation to to do it over the long haul. But most people don't handle it well. I think yeah. Jim Carrey is a good example of somebody that almost flew too close to the sun, right? He had, in the same year, he had three monster hit movies yeah. and basically could get any movie he made. And I think now he admits like he didn't like a lot of it. Well, I think when you get that successful and you've been given the ability to be that creative, that uh, it just makes you start questioning everything. Uh, Gary talked a lot about this, just how much do I need to do? Like, and, and who am I doing it for? Right. So if you've, you know, if you've succeeded and your dreams have come true and you've expressed yourself, you've designed your life to, to be a certain person. And at some point you think, well, who am I really beneath all of this? Yeah. Beneath this reputation, beneath the celebrity, like, who am I? And I, I think that people get very interested in, in that journey. And I think it's very common with creative people, uh, because you, you, how much can you give? Well, yourself. and also, like, do you hit a point where something good happens and then you go, is that all there is? It's like the famous Jerry West story where he tried his whole career yeah. to win the championship. And then finally in 1972, yeah. after 13 years, they won. And he was just bummed out. And he was like, sure. I wish we had beaten the Celtics. Like, he just he somehow fixated on the one yeah. thing that wasn't good about it. It's like, oh, we beat the we didn't beat the Celtics, so this doesn't totally count. And then started hating himself again. Well, you what happens is when you have a a good moment and say life is going well and your family's going well and then you, you know you, you make a movie or something that goes well you you discover the limits of your ability to be happy yeah because you think this is it everything's good and then that worked out so this is how it feels i am maxed out <laughs> right now yeah and if you're still feeling anxious or depressed or weird you're really bummed out because then you go, oh, it's me. None of this has anything to do with me being happy or unhappy or fulfilled. It's right. all something else. Great. Now I got to work on that. Right. Uh, uh, and that's, I think that's a, a, a common struggle. You hit this for theme people. in your in your book in a couple of the interviews because yeah. I think both of us are kind of famous are are fascinated by the effects that fame has on and success has on people. Yeah, I think that it's... That's why we both love the Eagles documentary. Uh, yeah, because they don't understand what it did to them. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> There's a complete lack of understanding. <laughs> lack of self-awareness. <laughs> I know. It, it, what's, what I love about the Eagles documentary is that, that they love it. And yeah. they don't see anything to be embarrassed about in it. Yeah. And they're comfortable being that truthful. But they also don't quite understand how people are reading it. Yeah. Uh, 
that's a part of the complexity of the Eagles documentary. Yeah, Glenn Fry says at one point he's whatever song they're fighting about that the yeah. guitarist thought he could yeah. sing, and Glenn Fry's like, "We had Don fucking Henley." <laughs> That's who should have sang, but then the, then you find out like Glenn Fry wanted to sing all the songs. Like, yes, his case for Don Henley should sing that song was also the thing that drove him crazy because he felt like he yeah. had lost control of the band. Well, it's what's, great. It's a great power struggle. But what's fascinating about that documentary is they seem to ignore that the main struggle in the band was between the two Glenn guys. Fry and Don Henley, and so they, they're they're blaming like the bass player, <laughs> right? You know, Don felt there. <laughs> it's all his fault, and, uh, and and that's why it's also fascinating how, how they've decided to tell that story because there's a whole. It's like well, leaving there's a out financial element to it. Well, it's like leaving out the arguments between Lennon and McCartney. Yeah, and blaming George for everything. Uh, which they do do the Beatles sometimes. Like, oh, Ringo quit. Right, he was right. the first one to quit. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, but I love those kind of stories. Yeah, it's always interesting to see how people handle it. And that is a question that Gary was always pondering, which is, who am I doing this for? Like, I'm making things. Is it for me? Is it to be famous? Is it to have an ego? Is it to prove I can do it? Yeah. Or is it a, a pure expression of who I am? Uh, is, is it a beautiful thing? Is it a needy thing? You know, why, why do we do this stuff? It seemed like he, to me, who only talked to him, I don't know, a couple times and, but followed his career pretty intensely. It seemed like he never got over the Sanders show. He felt like it just was everything he wanted to do. And then I agree after with that. the fact, like the, the, the telling sign to me was when they did the DVD and he went and did like 18 hours of interviews yes. and, it's the interviews. I loved all of them, but they were also like ten percent weird because it was yeah. clear that he hadn't let go of the show yet. Well, also that he, in some way, wasn't there fully when they made it. That he was so obsessed with making it that he didn't. Yeah, he was he, learning stuff. He didn't really know what happened. It was almost like he went into a trance and did it. Yeah, and 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 in a way, I think you almost go crazy when you're making something like that. It becomes your apocalypse now. Yeah. And suddenly relationships are weird and you're doing everything to serve this creative idea. It's not bringing out your best self some of the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, Gary got along great with the actors, but you know, the writing was always a struggle because he was so good. No one could keep up with him. Yeah. And then he would get frustrated. Uh, and so that's a tough dynamic when the best writer in, at the show is the star and he's busy acting and you're trying to figure out what he would like when he's not there and he's a genius and he's a genius so the, and you know your staff isn't all geniuses so then he's has to fix everything and he's exhausted yeah so it's a, so i think what he did those dvd extras which are so great and weird you know he boxes really with weird. alec baldwin yeah. and he interviews him while they're boxing and they're really hitting each yeah. other and uh, and then he has breakfast with Sharon Stone. That's and, the weirdest one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because she was only on like one episode. And, uh, and she's she's grilling him about why he's not married. Right. Um, yeah, it's really worth going through. I think that I think that at some point, the Larry Sanders was Gary searching for some kind of truth, and then he did. He obsessed with the DVD extras because he wanted to get even closer to the truth. So it wasn't even the Larry Sanders show. It was the people who made it and what really happened. Right. And I think that was his journey. Like he wanted things to get more and more honest till you're just, you know, sitting with your ex-girlfriend who was on your show talking through your problems yeah. on your DVD extra. I, when I spent time with him, usually we didn't talk to a slow... I, you always have to be careful with celebrities because they get it a million times. I'm sure mm -hmm. you get it. Like I love yeah. super bad and people just yes. want to talk about it and yes. don't realize that people keep coming up to you and talking to you about, mm -hmm. you know, the best things you've done. And with him, not only was he ready to talk about Sanders, he was more excited to talk about it than I was. Yeah. And we, we just went an hour mm -hmm. and he would have gone six. Sure. And he just, I don't know. That made me think like he, he, obviously realized he had achieved this ceiling for something I think that he was just trying to get back. I think he knew that that was his uh, Sergeant Pepper or yeah. whatever, and he was really proud of it. And I think on some level, he didn't want to do anything that wouldn't be as good and never had an idea that he thought would be as good. Right. And yeah, there was a fear of disappointing people who... 
I think, think that had a, to be part I, of I it. I think he was just smart. He, he, he knew, he also knew how much energy it would take. Do you think that's take. smart though? Because well, I would argue him not doing stuff isn't smart. Because well, he was so smart. I think that it took a lot out of him and then he was not ready trying yet. to like regain the enthusiasm and the energy to go through it again. Because it is like going to war making yeah. one of these shows when you're someone like Gary. Some people are very craftsmanlike and they're brilliant. Pete Holmes could not enjoy making Crashing more. Yeah. But we're doing eight episodes. We used to do 18 uh, yeah. at Larry Sanders show. Then he slowly reduced it to 10. But it was really hard. And I also think that since that show, which was 20 years ago, we figured out how to schedule the production and the writing of a show where the head writer is the star in a human way that they didn't know how to do with. Oh, Gary. that's interesting. So, so in 98, it was a disaster. They caved his head in. They were, they, it didn't make sense. He was, he was doing a sitcom week with a single camera show. When we do Pete show, we've written all the episodes before we start shooting. At the Larry Sanders show, we didn't have any episodes. So he was writing constantly because we had no scripts. You know, and that's just how it was. He was like a sitcom. We'd read it on Monday. We'd shoot it through Thursday and Friday. 17 pages a day. Yeah. Like a movie is four. So that's how tired Gary was. 17 a day. Nobody does that. It was a mistake of production. You know, but he wanted to work on a sitcom type of schedule. If you read it on Monday, you rehearse Tuesday, Wednesday, you shoot Thursday, Friday. But that doesn't work. I'm pretty sure that I'm right on this because I'm old and I forget stuff. But the end of Sanders was what, like June 2016? Uh, 1998? June? 98. Somewhere, yeah, yeah, yeah. Somewhere in June, right? Because I remember like right around the same time Jordan was playing Utah trying to win the third straight finals. And people were wondering if he was going to retire. Mm -hmm. And I just remember having this moment. I didn't have a lot going on at the time. Yeah. I was a frustrated writer. Mm -hmm. like you know. Um, but I remember thinking, like, God, I'm losing Jordan and Sanders in the same <laughs> month. Like, this fucking sucks. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what am I going to replace this with? I was, like, just bummed out. That's you know? So but that there just wasn't a lot of great TV like that back then. Oh, yeah. There was, there was almost just, nothing. They really, it's just, it's, when we, when we now did there's 20 shows, you just move on to the next one. When we did Freaks and Geeks, the only single camera comedy was The Wonder Years. That was the only that thing that was single camera. Wow. And then we did Undeclared the next year, and then it was just The Wonder Years and Bernie Mac. <laughs> Bernie Mac. And, and that was it. Uh, so, and and people, we, people thought we were crazy. They didn't know what, what we were doing. What are you going to do for This Is 40 Us? Are you going to do a single camera? Us. This is 40 us. <laughs> I don't know. I do want to do this as the 50. The jerking. I turned 50 this year, so this is 50 is... Oh. Like, you, did you turn 50 already or it's coming? End of the year, so... This I, is 50. So this is 50. I, I oh, guess Amazon's on the phone. They just offered $25 yes. million. It's my boyhood. It's my boyhood. <laughs> I'm doing boyhood, but just in a series of, of films. Um, We should wrap up. How long was that? Yeah, like 66. Oh, 66? Do you want to, Sam, do you want to do super bad on the pod or just for you? I think just for us. Okay. It'll be for, uh, okay. We need to ask you about super bad because okay. we're doing a super bad oral history for. Okay. So we need like three minutes on that. Um, did we hit everything? Uh, sure. We hit Big Sick again and uh, oh, yeah. stand All right. up again. Let's, let's, let's hit the end. All right. So Big Sick's coming out when? Big Sick uh, is coming out this, I guess it'll be Friday in, in New York and LA in June, July 14th. Around the country, nobody flies in it. This is like an old movie where people just talk. Yeah, but it, it really is a—you know—it's a gem. It is like one of those Little Miss Sunshine movies that deserves a massive audience because you know we test these movies when we're editing them, and people like this movie better than any movie I've ever made. Higher than Bridesmaids, higher than Knocked Up. Really? Higher. People really love this movie, and it's a strange movie to describe. Because it's this bizarre immigrant love story with disease. Yeah. Uh, but it's it really works perfectly. It's just hysterical and very sweet. And Ray Romano just tears the house down. Just one of those movies where it, it, it just... It's everything you want in a movie. And it's everything you want in a movie that would make you go to the movies to watch a comedy with people. Because we're all so used to waiting for things to show up on Do you cable. worry about those movies working as a... Uh people actually go in the theater to see them 
that we've hit some sea change? I, I, you know, here's the thing. It's tough to get me to go to the movie theater. I went to see Wonder Woman the other day, but I, I'm not in the theater that often, and I don't know if that's because there's less movies I want to see in the theater, or I'm, I'm I, the just, same kind I, of I just hate people texting. I, I don't like people breathing on me. People are loud, eating their popcorn, like right at the most emotional moment where someone's like, you know, you know, about to die. That's when the guy takes a, the first bite of popcorn. Right. <laughs> you know, like I like I want to kill people half the time. So I do understand why people like being home alone. But when it, this when is it, the opening of This Is Fifty, I think <laughs> <laughs> you complaining about people in a movie theater. <laughs> I know. But when you see a great comedy with people, there's nothing better. I think even better than action movies. I remember seeing I agree. something about Mary and the place going fucking. I was just nuts. gonna say that's that's the hardest I've ever seen a theater yeah. laugh at a scene when he gets his balls caught in the zipper. Yeah, it was like almost a riot in the theater. People were. I dying. saw it with Stiller. We went to Santa Monica on opening night and watched it from the back of the room, and I, I just kept turning to him, going, "What is going on? This is the funniest thing I've ever seen." And 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 the big sick really is right up there. It's it's a beautiful movie. So I hope people will go to that. And, and then you uh, have some comedy things you're doing. And I'll be at the Wilbur. Uh, July. Know, July. Washington, at, but we said the, the times July. earlier. We told you the times. You could find it. You could Google it. And uh, in, in Richfield, Connecticut. I think that's the Columbus Theater. And we're coming up on the 25th anniversary of when you did the Young Comedian Special. Is that yes, right? Yes, which is funny because Ray Romano and I were on the Young Comedian Special together in 1992. With two other... It wasn't everybody... Garofalo, Kindler, Nick DiPaolo, Bill Bellamy, Diana Carvey hosted... So this is a, the Big Sick is a bit of a reunion of the 1992 HBO Young Comedian Special. I hate that I was on a Young Comedian Special 25 years ago. It does. I I remember watching that special, and it, in some ways it doesn't feel 25 years. In yeah. other ways, it feels like 80 years. Because my jokes are fresh. Still, no, it just seems fresh. like a, a long time ago. <laughs> I was a terrible performance by me because it was the first time I was on HBO. So it was the first time I could curse. So I would just add fucks into clean jokes for no reason. Yeah. So jokes that never had a curse. I'd go, and this <laughs> fucking guy. And <laughs> it's terrible. It's awful. <laughs> All right, thank you for coming on. It was good to Appreciate be Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thanks so much to CreditWise from Capital One. It's a free app. It lets you track the factors that make up your credit health using information from your TransUnion credit report. You can check it anytime without negatively impacting your credit. Download CreditWise today. Don't forget to subscribe to Joe House's new food podcast. This is going to be the greatest food podcast of all time. I feel very confident saying this. It is called House of Carbs. Subscribe right now. Do it for me. Do it for Joe House. Do it for the love of food. It's going to be fantastic. We've had some luck lately spinning off podcasts against all odds with Cousin Sal swept America by storm. Uh, it is turning a nation into a nation of gambling addicts. House is going to do the same for food. We're all going to gain five pounds after we start listening to this podcast. Check it out. Joe House's new food podcast. And that's it for me. We are going to be back much later in the week, but we will have another podcast this week. The BS Podcast coming back to you uh, in about a day or two. Thank you.